Hey church, welcome. I'm Brenda and we've got a lot of fun going on today. Before we jump in, take a second and invite friends and family, or even someone you barely know, to join us. You can do this by sending them a quick text with the link or share on your social media. This week is our final week in the Explore God series, and we've got Julie Easley sharing knowing God and the love of God. We cannot wait to hear what she has to say on this. But we all know we have to do before that, right? You ready, Mr. B? My little stick man, I shall name you Wendell. Oh, Wendell, I love you with all my heart. How I wish you can love me too. How I wish you can know my great love for you, Wendell. But alas, you're made of stick and pipe cleaner. My heart is filled with sadness. <laughs> Perhaps Professor T can bring you to life. Mr. B. Professor T. What have you got there? I've made my most wonderful creation in the whole world. It's Wendell. Wow. And I just wish that he could be alive and know me like I know him. <laughs> wow. He's something. Can, you, can you bring him to life like Frankenstein? Well, I mean, okay, here, let me give it a try. I don't know. Let's just... Let me see what I can do with little Wendell, okay? Oh, Wendell, Wendell, Wendell. If only he could be if alive. Only... We would run on the beach. We would skip, we would jump. We would play basketball with little peanuts. The shape of his body, Wendell. Oh, Wendell. Wendell! He's alive, Wendell! Wendell, can you, can you hear me, Wendell? Wendell, can, can you see into my heart, Wendell? Uh, Mr. B, you do know that Wendell's not really alive, right? Yeah. <coughs> I mean, yeah, I, I knew that, Professor T. Yeah. I was just, I was just kidding. But I mean, I see you took such great care to make him and there's so many details on him. I mean, what would it be like if you really could talk to Wendell and get to know him and Wendell could get to know you. Oh, don't tease with my heart, Professor T. That'd be amazing. I love yeah, it. Yeah, but what if Wendell walked away? No, Wendell, don't go. What if Wendell didn't want to get to oh, know you? Oh, my life would be crushed. Oh, that'd be awful. I mean, this kind of reminds me of something. The, the, this peanut man reminds you of something? Yeah, like you took such great care to make Wendell. It reminds me of what God did for us. God created us with such great care and thought and planning, and all he wants is a relationship with us. He wants us to know him as well as he knows us. Whoa, holy truth bomb, Professor T. 
Oh wait, you're taking Wendell? I, I kind of like Wendell. Can I have him? Psalm 139 verses 13 and 14 say this, For you formed me in my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. God created us and he desires to know us and for us to know him. And we can get to know him more by reading his word, the Bible, and by talking to him in prayer. God also desires for us to be together forever in heaven. And he proved it to us by sending his son Jesus to live and to die and to rise from the dead so that our sins could be forgiven. And then God sent his Holy Spirit to work faith in our lives. Wow, God really loves us even more than I love little Wendell. And with my best friend playing all day, me and Wendell at the beach, me and Wendell at the hoagie store, eating sandwiches. Wendell, we're best friends forever. What a joy it is to watch Mr. B and Professor Terry each week. They have the best time. While you're listening to the message today, be sure and share any questions or observations you have in the live chat. We'll go over these live on our online campus Facebook group, Monday at noon. Not part of that group yet? Well, what are you waiting for? It's the perfect place to meet up during the week and connect. Julie, it's game time. Let's get ready to hear about the love of God. Life is a journey. With all its ups and downs, there are so many questions along the way. That's why we're starting a new series called Explore God, where we'll look at common and significant questions about God and faith. Questions like, what's your purpose? Is the Bible reliable? Are science and faith incompatible? Is Christianity part of the problem? Why would God allow pain and suffering? Is there only one way to heaven? How can I know God personally? So today I'm going to tell you a love story as our final stop on the journey of exploring God. Actually, two love stories. The first one starts in 1991. I was 21 years old and a brand new college graduate. I had accepted a first grade teaching job in Philadelphia, halfway across the country from the Chicago suburb I had grown up in. I decided to strike out on my own and move to a big city that I had no experience with or connection to, and it was going to be an adventure. Six weeks after I moved, I was completely second guessing myself. I was young friendless, living alone, and tackling a new job teaching 25 six-year-olds to read and write. It was a lot. Someone suggested going to the singles group at the church I had begun attending, but I was resistant. I was 21 years old for crying out loud. I was not ready for the single scene. Two weeks later, guess which lonely someone was making her first appearance at the singles group? I prayed to meet someone, anyone who could be a friend to me. And did I ever? God answered my prayer in the person of Dale Easley. He was smart, interesting, challenging, and he made me laugh. 30 years later, he still does. My relationship with Dale changed the trajectory of my life. In a moment, my old pre-Dale life had gone and my new life with Dale had begun. In the same way, a relationship with Jesus changes our lives. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. This is the second love story I'm referring to. This relationship is more than a set of behaviors that make you a good person. It's more than the traditions in which you might have been raised. And it's more than an intellectual agreement to the doctrines of Christianity. It's a day-to-day -day experience with the three-person God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This relationship may have had a very definitive start date, or it may have been a more gradual thing, but it's a living relationship. John 1.12 says this, 
But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to be children of God. When we receive, through faith, Christ's finished work on the cross for us, we are counted as dead to sin and alive to God, and the Holy Spirit fills our lives, changing us from the inside out. Our old life is gone, and our new life has begun. Some of the most treasured features of any healthy long-term relationship are trust and security. After 27 years of marriage, Dale has proven to be a husband that I can trust. I have an enormous amount of confidence and security in our relationship. If we can have confidence in people who are always imperfect, how much more can we be confident and secure in our relationship with God? God can always be trusted. Today I'd like to unpack three means God has provided for us to be confident in Him. The promises in His Word, the Bible, Jesus' death and resurrection, and the experience of walking with the Lord. These three things are like the legs of a stool, giving us a safe and trusted place to land. After a year and a half of dating and th a three-month engagement, Dale's and my wedding date of July 3rd was approaching. It was time to get the marriage certificate at the Cook County Clerk's Office in Chicago. We still have that certificate in a filing cabinet in Dale's office, signed by our officiating pastor. It's a physical reminder of the vows we made that day, as are our wedding rings. On days we are fighting, driving each other nuts, feeling distant, or are simply sick of each other, the certificate in the filing cabinet and the rings on our fingers are reminders that, that no matter what, we're married. It's a fact. The happy feelings may not be there that day, but the fact of our marriage remains, and we hold on to that fact and faith until the good feelings return. Just like our marriage certificate is written documentation of my marriage to Dale, God has provided us with the Bible as a tangible written assurance of his love, his plan of salvation, and his guide for daily living. God's word is our first means of confidence in him. 1 John 5.13 says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. And in Proverbs we read, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. On days when you feel far from God or when circumstances are overwhelming, you can return to the truth of God's word over and over again. Relying on feelings alone as an assurance of faith is a dangerous place to be. Jeremiah 17 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? During times of overwhelm, frustration, and doubt, it's crucial that we return to the Bible to remind ourselves of what is true. Romans says that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the words of Jesus. When I think about my marriage, I also think about our wedding day. It was 95 degrees and incredibly humid. Dale was in a tux and I wore a high-necked wedding dress and we suffered through outdoor pictures until the photographer called it quits because he couldn't see through the perspiration running into his eyes. <laughs> I remember the dancing the night away on a packed dance floor and the joy we felt that day. Other people were witnesses to our wedding and they would remember it too, even if the memory has grown hazy with time. In the same way, we as Christians can point to a historical event as our second means of confidence in God, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus' physical body was gone after remaining in the tomb for three days. Matthew 28 says this about what the guards did after discovering the empty tomb. Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. The resurrected Jesus then appeared to many, to Mary Magdalene, to the men on the road to Emmaus, and in 1 Corinthians we read that he appeared to more than 500 people at the same time, many of whom are still living at the time of Paul's writing. Most notable here, though, is the story of the disciples who spoke passionately of their own experience with the risen Jesus and went willingly to their deaths for their resurrected Savior. 
Chuck Colson, special counsel to President Nixon, who later became a follower of Jesus and founder of Prison Fellowship, had this to say about the disciples. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and then they proclaimed that truth for over 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And finally, when I think about the reality of my marriage, I think about the actual experience of it. There have been big moments, the birth of our three precious sons, Michael, Thomas, and Samuel, and the joy of raising them to adulthood. Three cross-country moves, new jobs, and new opportunities. But there are a million small moments, too, sitting across from each other at the dinner table, hearing his great singing voice next to me in church, working on home projects together with equal measures of hilarity and frustration, and putting my cold feet on him in bed. <laughs> These are moments that make up a life, the stitches of the fabric that bind the two of us together. Just like the daily moments of a marriage attest to its reality, the daily moments of our life with God do the same. In John 14, Jesus says, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with them. Make our home with them. Not stop by for a quick meet and greet, not stay for a long weekend, make our home with them. Here's another from Revelation. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. When you open the door of your heart and acknowledge Jesus' saving love for you on the cross, the Holy Spirit becomes your closest companion. It's a promise that Jesus gave to his disciples and it's true for us today. But here's where I want to challenge each one of you today. How much of your life are you opening up to God? Are you compartmentalizing him to an hour or two on Sundays? Or do you only throw up a lifeline to him when things get really bad? God has so much more for you than that. He wants to minister to you with his healing word every day. He wants you to pour out your joy, your fear, your wonderment, your pain, and your heart. To him in prayer. Every day can be an unfolding adventure with the Lord if you surrender your life to him. But is God too busy, too important to care about the mundane details of your life? No, it's just not so. Author Dallas Willard reminds us that it's the very greatness of God that allows him to be aware of and care for all these details. Nothing is too small for his loving care. Here's his quote. The person who does not want to bother God with personal requests thinks it honors the greatness of God. In fact, it contradicts what God has taught us about himself in the Bible and in the person of Christ. His greatness is precisely what allows him to plan his day around me and everyone else as he chooses. God wants to reveal himself to you in the everyday moments of your life, but he will not force his way in. The latch of your heart is on the inside, and you need to welcome Jesus in and create space for him. Here's a beautiful encouragement from Ann Voskamp to consider as I close out today's message. Give up what is lesser to get more of the greater. Declutter what fills your mind, fills your screens, fills your heart. Less is more God. Your loves alone limit how much God you have. You have as much of God as you actually want. Just sit on that for a moment. Your love of the things of this world are the only things keeping you from God. What can you release today to make room for more of God in your life? You can have as much of God as you actually want. Your love story with him has many chapters yet to be written. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart today. If you have yet to receive him as your Savior and Lord, today is a perfect day for that. Click on the button in the live chat feature or click the link on our chat via Facebook or YouTube and let us help you take the next step of faith.
We have a gift for you that will help you get started on your new journey with Jesus. And finally, if you have any questions about this message, write them down. I'll be going live with a couple of other King of Kings teachers on Monday at noon Central Standard Time in our online campus Facebook group, and we'll be discussing this topic in more depth. Thanks so much for joining me today, and blessings on your week.
Wow, what a great message. Now is the time if you wanna support this ministry to do so. You can do that via text or online. Well, that's all we got. Tune in next week, same time, same place. We love you and we are so blessed by you. Have a great week.